Good day and welcome to Window, your favorite podcast focusing on development, agriculture, investment, and business issues. I am Ari Ivo at the African Center for Community and Development. In today's program, we shall be looking at how Africa can maintain the flow of investments into the continent. To begin with, Africa is witnessing huge flows of external and domestic financing. Recent movements include 500 million US dollar commitment to African infrastructure from a group of Danish fund investors, as well as infrastructural financing in the continent to the tune of 59.4 billion US dollars in 2012, according to the IMF. Interest rate is increasing in the continent. South Africa and Ghana and the entire ECOWAS region are establishing businesses in a wide array of sectors, while Morocco is also shaping funding streams to many countries across the continent. Despite these, Africa is faced by a lot of factors and risks that can keep investors concerned, including fragility caused by tribal, religious, and other conflicts, climate change, migrations, and hunger, just to mention these. A third of African countries, home to about 200 million people, is considered fragile. This includes countries like Libya and Cote d'Ivoire. Despite this, we must note that some countries can be fragile, but still growing. And with an average per capita income rising from 300 US dollars to 333 from 2005 to 2011. Some other things you can find in fragile economies are things like high child mortality, lower rates of primary school completion, malnutrition, and water and sanitation issues. With this, one can say things are a little bit bleak for Africa, but that is not the case. If we can try to maintain its investment flows. No part of the world is perfect. So how can Africa maintain the flow? We think it should continue in the path of effective implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals in that it is the policy and the strategy and the growth framework globally for the next 15 years but it must do so strategically with the influence of African countries and have people in mind. It must reform or continue to reform politically to guarantee rights and to cut corruption and capital flights that can reach up to 50 billion US dollars annually. Guaranteeing rights means that investors will feel their property and themselves will be protected within countries, hence have the guarantees to do business in an enabling environment across Africa. Africa must continually boost the investments in infrastructure and its financing, as we noted, got to $59.4 billion in 2012, according to the IMF, and so it should continue in that light. And in that same period, its investments in energy grew by 37%, and it must continuously try to exploit all forms of energy, especially as Africa still has 600 million people who do not have access to electricity. This might be bad, but it opens doors for foreign direct investments into the continent in the areas of energy and infrastructural development, 
in areas like road transport networks, rails, and even air transport systems. Africa must continue to reduce the gaps between women and men, and this is to facilitate better contribution towards GDP, which is very important in branding African countries as being capable of handling financial streams and hands of assessing loans by certain international financial institutions. She must invest in education to better the skill sets locally and therefore to be able to position herself, herself to be able to assess the futuristic jobs that obtain in the 21st century and in this period where the ICT seem to be playing an important part in terms of the job landscape globally. She must diversify her economy not to be affected by the fall in commodity prices. We must also state that many African countries have been doing this and many have been seeing the need to diversify into agriculture as well as into industrialization and some are even considering the possibility of nuclear energy generation in order to reduce the gaps in the generation of energy in industrialization as well as in the well-being of Africans. She must seek to affect currency reforms not to be affected by fiscal policies from without or by austerity measures linked to economies closely attached to the African economies. She must include, encourage the flow of remittances that have reached 63 billion annually. It therefore means that the African diaspora must be encouraged to invest here, must be encouraged to leverage from the opportunities within and to establish small and medium-sized enterprises, incubation labs, as, act, as well as act as accelerators to businesses in Africa. They must be able to liaise with partners from out of Africa who do not understand Africa or do not have situational intelligence of Africa to be able to better the flows of capital into Africa. Despite this, the international community must also try to respect the terms of the Washington Consensus, which were to facilitate the movement of capital, of labor, and trade between countries. And this is very important, as Africa seems not to have a good share of the international market, hence is probably more poor than it ought to be if there was a more equitable global market system. There must be the restructuring of aid to be more inclusive and participatory. After over a trillion dollars of aid to Africa, it must be done in such a way that Africans believe they are part and parcel of the instruments that are designed to develop them. And arguably, this is good for project management as ownership is one of the key pillars towards the success of any intervention as heralded by scholars including Go and Moose as far back as 1988, Cosford and Franks in 1993, Tona and Franks in 2006, Hall and Midgley in 2004, and all these scholars suggest the fact that participation and even partnerships are the, the future of modern social or socioeconomic policy delivery. Um, one other important um, writer or writers in this light is Sullivan and Skelcher in 2002, that we must borrow from them to be able to justify what Africa still needs to do. And Africa needs to develop stock exchanges to fight global speculation. This is happening because stock exchanges, increased from eight to eight in 2002 to 29 in 2013, and it's still growing. This is an opportunity for Africa to maintain the flow of investors. 
in the region. Regional integration and intra-trade is something that also will facilitate the flow of labor and capital, and it shall also reduce suspicion between countries and also create a superstructure for more broader regional investments or cross-border investments. We must say that intertrade in Africa is improving and doubled between 2005 and 2012 from 62 billion US dollars to 147 billion US dollars. But we must also note that half of this intertrade is taking place in the Southern African Development Community, which means that it needs to be stepped up in other parts of Africa, in the CIMAC region, in East Africa, and in Northern Africa. The benefits of intertrade include labor mobility, exchange of skills, replication of tested practices, and many other factors. And Africa must also leverage on her middle class that has a consumption power. Africa has 350 million people who can now earn between two to 20 US dollars a day, and therefore Africa must transform goods and services in order that they are consumed by this now well-developed and established middle class that is growing in the continent. And, and that is seen the continent as a place to carry out tourism and other investments. Thank you very much for tuning in to Window. We have actually touched the issue of how Africa can maintain the flow of its investments. And we did say Africa is witnessing huge flows of external and domestic financing, and recent movements have included a $550 million commitment to African infrastructure from a Danish fund of investors, and as well as Africa attained $59.4 billion on infrastructural financing in 2012, according to the IMF, and we are seeing that capital flows are happening between South Africa and ECOWAS and between Morocco and other African countries, just to mention these few, despite the fact that Africa is also witnessing some aspects of fragility that keeps the continent down and that also impacts on sectors like health and education as well as malnutrition and conflicts. But at the end of it, we see if there can be structural adjustment within Africa and the reduction of the gaps between women and men, investments in education, diversification of the economy, as well as effective currency reforms and the restructuring of aid and the development of a stock market across the continent, as well as regional integration, Africa will, in this light, maintain the flow of investments within its boundaries. Thank you very much for tuning in. It has been Ari Ivo Bonger from the African Center for Community and Development.